Hello and welcome back to the Audience Podcast. I'm your host, Craig Hewitt. In this episode, I'm joined by Ben Pines of Elementor. Ben is the head of content and product evangelist at Elementor, which is the most popular website builder for WordPress. In this episode, Ben and I are going to kind of dive into what it really means to be a content creator. Uh, I think Elementor and Castos are really aligned in this respect that we help enable people to create content online. But I think what we're going to do in this episode is kind of debunk some of the the most popular myths out there about how easy it is to to kind of make it as a content creator and kind of run a successful online business. So Ben, welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you. Hi, Craig. Hi, how's it going? Ah, it's great. I uh, can't wait to dive in. It's my favorite topic. Awesome. Awesome. I like taking a bit of a contrarian stance on this. I I think that in a way, it's our responsibility as people that create content online to not just say, yeah, all you do is, you know, spin up a WordPress site, use Elementor, start a podcast, get an audience, and you're going to be making, you know, $100,000 a year right off the bat. And I think it's important for folks to say, yeah, you could, but (laughs) there's a lot of things you have to do before you can get there. Because otherwise, I think a lot of people would be quitting their jobs and trying to do this. And I think you and I can both attest that this is hard, right? There's a lot of competition out here and there's a lot of stuff that we all have to do. So yeah, I think let's start there. Like, What's your kind of experience and stance on this? Well, I recently uh, read like uh, this big, there's a big yearly uh, report by Upwork about uh, freelancers and, and work. And it seems like this industry is growing at a huge rate, like freelancers who work online, uh, like millions of Americans and people uh, from ar- across the world. So it's a, a booming industry. People are pouring in and want, they understand that the whole industry is moving online with COVID. The importance of having an online presence has been made very clear. But the problem is that those people need uh, to know the wor- the ropes. It's a profession. It's something that requires investment. And when you go online and you, you search for information and you see, as you said, you see the YouTubers and influencers, what they preach is usually it's easy, just takes a few steps. And what ends up happening is this industry is uh, overpopulated with unprofessional people. And that's a cycle because you end up with non-professional websites, uh, the business owners fail and uh, et cetera, et cetera. You, you just get spam that accumulates and uh, regenerates itself. As you're kind of describing this, I'm just nodding my head and say, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I have a handful of like common traits that come to mind for me just in content creation in general, but also with podcasting. But I'm curious from your perspective, like what are some things that you see people doing that are mistakes as they kind of start down this path? Like what if you see something happen, say, ooh, that that person better change their path or, or they're kind of destined to fail. Okay, let's start with positivity. The, the positive okay. <laughs> note is that the, the positive note is the initial uh, motivation that people have. Like I want to uh, have, I don't know if, if someone wants to be a digital nomad, uh, travel across the world, have a creative profession, like create something. It doesn't matter if it's a website or a podcast or a, a YouTube channel. People now are earning their, their living doing that. That's the initial positive starting point. But then you see people who actually have success online and it doesn't seem like they have the right credentials. You know, there's one kid that what he does is like toy reviews and he has like 17 million subscribers. And there's one uh, TikTok star that what she does is like 10 second uh, dance uh, videos. And you look at those and say like, I don't need uh, uh, to invest time. I just, I need to find them who can do it. What those people see is just the end result. They don't understand that behind this kid and behind this girl, there's a lot of investment. You you just see the end result, but there's a lot of production and thinking and strategy that made these people succeed and make millions of followers follow them. So that's the biggest mistake, like seeing that shiny influencer or star and saying, to make it happen, I just need like finding a hook that's superficial, but salesy and then i can make it but the truth is that uh, if you do want to make it so the biggest mistake is just starting out without having a a proper plan of investment and the way to circumvent this uh, mistake is just thinking of, of it the same way you would think of becoming a doctor or becoming a lawyer like First of all, to make what I do worthwhile, if it's a website, the websites I, I create need to be top-notch in terms of design, marketing, 
and uh, all the technical uh, things. But also, if I'm actually going to build a business around it, I also need to think of it as a business. So I need to learn all of the tricks of the trade of building a business. If it's, you know, again, strategy and sales and marketing. And so it's a huge investment. It's not very popular to like the quick success uh, mentality of today, but it's possible if you do that and think of, you know, I'll invest. I don't know, half a year and go, go to courses and, and invest time in it. I think the, the reward is, is promising. One of the things that, that gives me a lot of hope for this path, you know, I, I have children. Uh, my daughter turned 10 yesterday, so 10 and 8. And I think like they might not need to go to college or university, right? They could just go and they finish high school and then they could go do this. And, you know, I run an online business and they could too. And I think there, you know, that exists for people that are already in high school and college and, and you know, postgraduates and stuff like that. But like you're saying, there is a lot for them to learn of the tricks of the trade. And I think one of the beauties of online business is the transparency that a lot of people and companies like ours have about how they work and what's successful and stuff like that. And even if it's kind of shown through, say, like rose colored glasses, right? Like, oh, you just do this and then you're making, you know, $20,000 a month. That, that's obviously not the truth. So how can you leverage or take advantage of all of this wonderful content out there? You know, I'm thinking about folks like Pat Flynn, right? Who's obviously like a really great content creator, super transparent, very successful. How can you take things that that folks like that say in, in an industry or just in online business and kind of filter it to say, OK, I understand that like that's what they're saying, but they're already there. They've already made it. If I'm just starting, I need to like step back and consider the steps I need to take to get started on the right path. Yeah, well, I would say that content made by leading figures is great. And I fully like uh, I love to to get that content. I think that in the last 20 years, there's been a lot of new professions. Think about it. Like 20 years ago, SEO expert, content marketer, web designer, and, and so on and so on. There weren't these professions. So these are new professions and it's hard to find. Like, I don't think the universities are keeping up with uh, what the industry needs. The industry needs, you know, analysts and video producers. Like there's not enough programs that keep up uh, to date. So that's on the one scale. On the, on the second scale with consuming content that is, uh, from different, let's say that span the scope of, of web creation. There it's very easy to get to also get confused because you go into social media marketing and that's a tunnel that you can deep dive endlessly and you go into affiliate marketing. So it's very hard. So a, a lot of people and I've been talking to people in our industry and customers and many of them kind of, uh, you know, zigzag between things. So I would say the most important thing is if you find a niche you want to gain expertise at, then you can find the influencers and mentors that actually do that professionally. And you can just focus on that, clear the noise around that. And that's, that's a great way to kind of set up a success and say, like, say an investment, like in the next six months, I'm only going to invest in affiliate marketing. I'm going to take out all of the other noise and just what is your KPI? Like, how will you know that you reach the, the level of proficiency that you want in web design? Is it like you're able to create the level of design that your friends will say, like, this is something a, a professional agency would do? So set up that, think about that objective and, and results and, and strive for it and don't let go until you, you reach that. Talking about kind of reaching that goal and kind of arriving, one of the, I think, challenges that I talk with my like friends and colleagues in this space about it, is how marketing just in general and online content is so much more competitive than it's ever been really, I guess. And as like head of content, I'm sure you can attest to this, but but it's something that I'm sure you sit and think a lot about and you guys are excellent at it. As folks are trying to kind of like progress to the next step in their journey as a, a content creator and a marketer and a business person, I think one of the important things is deciding what's working and doing more of it and deciding what's not working and not doing any more of it. How do you make that decision at Elementor? Or how do you as a, a, a content creator make that decision of like, this is good, I want to do more of this, and this is not productive, we're not going to do this anymore? This is sometimes hard to make, especially if you, uh, I mean, we publish like around four or five articles per week, plus videos, plus we used to have a podcast of our own. So it's hard to kind of, if you create content that spans different areas, 
it's hard to, even if let's say you're an affiliate and you create different types of website, that also can be confusing because each one has their own parameters. If you run ads for certain parts of your content or you, you run them on social. So you do need to build processes that will keep you informed for each type of content you create. So if you're like a freelancer and you only invest in, in like specific type of content, let's say you're a designer and you only use Instagram to, to publish your, your work and showcase your work, then it's the, the job is easier because in time you will see what's working and what's not, you know, with, with comments or likes or, but if you're creating a, a vast, like different types of, uh, of content, then you need to think of processes, like more elaborate processes that involve, you know, analytics and setting up goals. And it's, it's a bit more complex, but it's the same uh, process. You decide on what are your KPIs and, and kind of monitor how, what works well, what, what doesn't. In the kind of content space, who do you look to as like inspiration or who educates you around this kind of thing? Like what success means and how to measure it with marketing? Well, I recently had a, a webinar with one of my heroes, <laughs> Andy Cristadina. So he did a whole episode about analytics for web designers, because this is a topic that usually people who actually build the website don't monitor the, the results. So analytics is like uh, originally uh, thought of as a tool for, you know, you hire an SEO professional or a marketing person. But actually, the people who build, it, it's much more obvious that the people who build the site need to check and make sure that what they build actually has an impact on the business. So someone builds a website not to, just to, you know, make sure the, the branding is good and the site looks good. They have a business goal. They want customers to go in, look, and buy from them. So here, measurement is, is very important. So uh, this is what uh, Andy talks about. That's on the measurement aspects. And I tend to switch between the different people that I, according to the, the mood I have. So yeah, I think uh, it takes a lot of investment also to make sure that what you're creating is not just goal-oriented, but also is remarkable. So here I would go to a recent content I consumed by Seth Godin, who has a great course on that and also several books on that, like how to create content that is remarkable enough to stand out among the crowd. And he has a whole philosophy on that. But one of the things that he preaches is like what you're saying can form an opinion. You can say something that forms an opinion on something and that has power. Like if you think of a regular article that uh, compares different uh, things like website versus a landing page. I don't know. You, you think of creating this uh, article. So one of the ways is just, you know, thinking about the pros and cons and creating, a, what do you say, a moderate comparison between the two. But a different approach would be, I'll take a stance. And it's clear for someone reading is this guy cares about this topic and he wants us to think in a certain direction. So that's just one tip that you can do to make sure the content actually makes an impact and is not just technically organized to be friendly to search engines. Yeah, he has several really good, but I mean, like Purple Cow comes to mind from Seth Godin as, as one of like his most popular books. Yeah, he's an amazing marketer. As you're describing that that kind of trade-off or differences in approaches is is something that that we are focusing a lot on right now, which is like we need to write about things that people are interested in and already searching for. So like writing for SEO to answer questions that you know our customers or potential customers already have, that's important. But also important and I think much more difficult is yeah, writing to tell a story and have a personality and be a brand is hard because it's risky and it takes guts and it might not work and you might piss people off. And yeah, I think that, I mean, that's something that we're starting to do more and more of now, maybe as we're a more mature brand ourselves, and maybe that's that's part of this progression. But I find it daunting almost to, to make that leap and say, we're going to say, this is the best tool for this product or, or this, you know, goal or whatever. And this is the best approach for monitoring your marketing efforts like i i just yeah i find it a little daunting to just really take a stance like as a company like me personally i'm fine with taking a stance but as a company i find it a little daunting like i don't know have you guys found that difficult to to really pick a side and not piss off the other parties <laughs> 
you know, it's risky. You pick a, you pick a side and then you can make mistakes. And uh, the product that you uh, recommended, let's take the, the extreme approach. It turns out to be, I don't know, a scam or something. And you ended up... <laughs> so I didn't. I just wanted to help. But, I, but that's what's cool about this industry and this... Uh, when you become a creative person, like someone who creates content or creates something, I think the thrill is like exploring the boundaries. Like you have to... Okay, the thing is you have to piss some people off you have to you can't be just for the general crowd you have to and again Seth Godin talks a lot about the minimum viable audience that you like you pick a certain personality type and you just delight them and everyone else you piss off I think there's a lot of value in this and I think if you think long term if you think about think like extreme I want to eventually be invited to I don't know TED Talks or something nobody is going to invite you if all of your career, you pick the, the medium, like not careful and, and not saying things. So if you want in 10 years to, to be invited there, you need to kind of take a stand. I think also uh, Nassim Taleb talks about this in his book, uh, Black Swan. The people that actually make it big are the ones that take the risks. Okay, so you kind of wanted to switch gears a little bit to get your take on things that like Elementor as a, a company and a, a group that sees a ton of people doing things on websites and in WordPress and online. Like, what are you excited about? Like, what are you starting to see that people are doing or is becoming more popular that that folks maybe aren't aware of yet? And, and like, maybe we need to be thinking about. Well, at Elementor, we started investing in Think about how people can create more consistent websites that are even more professional. So our latest release included the design system features. So things like uh, global colors and global typography. So this is definitely a direction that is important to us to make it as easy and streamlined as possible for people to build more consistent and more professional uh, websites. So this is an, an exciting route. Something that I'm kind of constantly amazed by is is the challenge of kind of keeping brand identity consistent as as our website and the the parts of our website grow. So I think that what you're talking about with the the design components is really great because I think it's easy, especially with WordPress, where it's so easy to just add another plugin or add another thing that does something on your site and then it has its own style. So the ability to control that kind of all the way through makes a lot of sense. That's actually a project that we're kind of embarking on internally now is just kind of auditing everything we do to make sure that, yeah, all the typography is the same, all the buttons are the same color and the same size, shape and fonts and all this kind of stuff. So that's that's really cool. I'll, I'll have to check it out. One thing that we're recording this episode on on Thanksgiving Day in the U.S. So Black Friday is is tomorrow. And one thing that I'm amazed about is I've been kind of in the online business space for like six years now is how email and email marketing is still for a lot of people like the best way to connect with their audience. Like, I think it's amazing. Like we have TikTok and Instagram and Twitter and all this kind of stuff and still email, which is God, it makes me feel old. 30 years old at this point, like in the mainstream, like uh, is the best way to go. And like, does that surprise you as a, as a marketer and someone that's kind of in this world? No, because I think the difference is that email is a lot more of your choice today. Like people want to have that uh, control and, you know, you get uh, bombarded by, by ads on, on Facebook and, and everywhere, actually. So one of the best ways is either go to a magazine or a, a website that you really trust and, and follow that or more easily just subscribe and get it to your email it's still hard to succeed in email because most people are, you know, I get it's so hard to keep up with email today. But yeah, it's it's going to remain because I think it's the avenue that has the most, it gives the most choice to the, to the user, which is good. You said it's hard to succeed with email. I agree. I, I think it's just more and more competitive all the time. What things do you feel are getting more kind of difficult and competitive in the email kind of marketing space? I think it's just people with busy lives that uh, need to filter out every email they get. So they only subscribe to think that, you know, because it's not just reading the email. The email purpose is that people actually click on the links and read it. And so they need to, their mentality needs to be like, I need to spend time. Like I, I need to have the, the enough time to, to read what I, uh, what I'm being sent to. 
So uh, that's definitely a challenge. I think that people are more looking for content that, again, will stand out, but also will enrich their lives somehow. At Elementor, we now have webinars and courses that get uh, a lot of popularity. I think because we sort of grew to become a, an expert and leader in you know, the, the freelance web creation uh, industry, uh, I think people turn to us to learn the, the tricks of the trade and learn how to build a site with Elementor. And we do try to offer the kind of the proper way. Elementor is on over 6 million and rising websites across the world. So I presume there's like 6 million different ways to, to build a website. And some of the ways, unfortunately, that I go and, and look at the tutorials, they're not actually the proper way to, to build a site. So people can use those methods and kind of have a problem along the way if they don't understand the basic of uh, and the, the, the right process to, to build a site. So in courses that we uh, churn out, we try to make sure that we, we offer the method that our own users, that our own designers uh, use in, in the company. Also, we release uh, templates that, uh, again, if you kind of look into how each element in the template is made, we make sure everything is in the proper way and there's no glitches and no, and it's all like building processes and building uh, the right methods of uh, operation. One thing that, that I'm sure that you, you see as like head of content and, and more on the evangelist side, maybe is like community around your brand. I know Elementor has a really strong brand and kind of community as a result of it. Is that something that you all actively try to to kind of encourage and nurture or or has that been kind of spontaneous in, in how it's developed? Yeah, for sure. We have a whole department meant for community. This has been a vital part of uh, our company since day one. It's it's a whole ecosystem. This ecosystem has needs. And I think a lot of companies don't think of, of the whole ecosystem and uh, it, it's a problem. And the, the huge advantage with an ecosystem is that you get, it's like a, a rainforest. You get all of, you know, different parts nourishing each other. So you have add-on developers that create hundreds of ways to extend Elementor, make it a bigger project than it is because we have a limited set of, of developers that work according to our priority. Uh, and by having others develop uh, add-ons, it, it just expanded the product uh, immensely. You have uh, developers and designers that meet at meetups, online meetups now, and talk about the uh, exchange methods and exchange the uh, business tips. And you have just people who, who need websites for their business. So for us, meeting them and getting insights from them is very crucial and actually also impacts the the product itself. So about 80% of what we develop actually comes from user requests and suggestions. So it's a great way to, to build a company. That's awesome. Kind of like really specifically, if you don't mind, like how do you interact with your partners and customers and things like that? I mean, like Facebook groups or your own kind of internal forums or support channels? Or like what's the, what are the methods of, of getting that feedback? So there's one Facebook group that has grown to like 85,000 uh, wow. members. <laughs> well, ours uh, is 2,000, 2, 2,500 maybe, I think. So I feel <laughs> I'm ashamed. Uh, well, it started, <laughs> it's not just four years ago. It was that uh, <laughs> okay. that number. And uh, also there are different groups across Facebook that are led by people, that leaders that we interact with and communicate with. So we make sure there's a common uh, discussion and uh, everything. Uh, if, if something needs our attention, we, we're uh, on it. Also, we started uh, meetups. It started not a long time before COVID started. Uh, so now we, we moved it to, to online meetups. But basically everything we do, we try to make it, we consider the, the aspects of community. So even if we have a feature release, we create the content. So I would say that uh, for me personally, and for a lot of uh, Elementor employees, it's actual direct conversation. Like a lot of uh, the, the insights are received from just, we, we know the, the, the key figures and the leading designers and we talk to them and we can gain insights. So I still believe that there's a huge value in just taking someone for uh, like a weekly conversation with someone and uh, asking questions and uh, sort of getting uh, their opinion. 
just another uh, plug, we also have big beta group. So spoiler alert, we're going to have a new release soon that is going to even improve. I, I can't say too much about it, but it's going to scale our efforts in terms of uh, using the community to test the plugin before, test the features before they come out. So that's a very exciting thing that's uh, going to happen soon. Yeah, no, I, I think that kind of bringing this back to podcasting a little bit, talking about community, people ask me, Craig, what's the most common thread you see with popular or successful podcasters? And it always is that the podcast is not the only thing they have to their brand. There is a community around it, whether it's a Slack channel or a Facebook group or Circle or an in-person, you know, church group or whatever. The podcast is like maybe the, the tip of the spear or just one thing they do, but then there's always this thing of a community that people continue the discussion and have their own discussions and is organic, you know, beyond them because you can only do so much with with content and with like especially online brand and you need a way for people to connect and continue that conversation afterwards. I think some people are scared of that because they say like, oh, I'm going to have an online business or I'm going to have a podcast where I just sit and talk for 30 minutes in the mic and then everybody listens and then I have this business. But amazingly, I think that the community gets that almost offline analog feel back that we all really connect with. And to me, I think that's why it is so common in successful brands. I think there's something unique about podcasting as opposed to, let's say, uh, text creation. When you write, it's very hard to kind of explore ideas. It's very hard. I mean, some writers can do that, but uh, it, it's very hard. It takes years of experience to kind of explore ideas through writing. But it's very easy to explore ideas through just talking to someone or even having a podcast uh, by yourself, especially if you have a, a, a topic that you kind of think about and sort of uh, spill what you have uh, in your mind. So I, th I think that's something uh, amazing uh, about podcasting, plus the fact that you don't have to, you know, uh, you can do it in your pajamas. Uh, <laughs> one of my favorite podcasts is the Conan O'Brien podcast. They talk about half an hour about what he dresses and uh, how he comes in all pale without makeup. Recently, I haven't, I kind of neglected my uh, podcast habit, but it's for a good cause because I, I started to hear a lot of uh, audiobooks. So all my commutes, I think that's the biggest competitors you have is not like video, it's like audiobooks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. And amazingly, like in some ways they're coming together. You know, if you look at shows like Hardcore History, right, it's like three and a half hours. <laughs> it's it's an audio, it's a full audio book. I agree. And I think that generally that's that's a good thing for folks to think about is like your competition is not, you know, Castos competition is not Libsyn or SoundCloud or Simplecast. It's audiobooks or just Spotify in general or not doing anything. Um, oh, and the audible, same for Elemental, audible right? It's not, they really changed my life, I have to say. Yeah, yeah, it's great. <laughs> what have you been listening to lately? Oh, again, I'm just, just re I, I, I had a bug where I just had to start reviving my, my book consumption. So just the classics. I love classic books like this. Uh, the recent one is, uh, Sylvia Plath, the, the bell jar. So yeah, just those books. I don't know, Henry Miller and, uh, yeah. That's awesome. It's really refreshing to hear someone like deep into online business kind of getting back to the classics and, and out of, always reading marketing stuff. When I was in, uh, in university, I, I used to read a lot. And then when I, when I got to online marketing and, and actual work and everything, I neglected this habit, but I'm thinking about how to actually gain insights for, you know, marketing and business and branding from these books. I mean, they, they, yeah, I think that the, the exceptional books that actually manage, if you think about how a book became successful and became a classic and you sort of try to decipher how they made it it's it's a very interesting question and if if you're a content creator or someone who thinks about content uh, standing out i think the best ways is not look at the current not only look at the gary v's of the industry <laughs> uh, even though they they have insights to give you but think of, of classics that survived 2000 years and see, say like, what did they do to make sure? And that's again, coming, returning back to Nassim Taleb's book, where he talks about like, actually in his book, uh, Anti-Fragile, like 
how he actually badmouths uh, an Amazon, uh, uh, you know, uh, the Kindle, because he says, books have been around for 2,000 years. I don't believe in technology that exists. I actually, I love Kindle, but uh, <laughs> this is becoming a, a commercial for Amazon. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I, I, I think about, I think this is a great tip for anyone who creates content. Like, how has something survived 100 years? Why do people still read it? And uh, how can you make something that, that lasts so, so long? I think that's a great place to, to wrap up. Ben, thank you so much for, for coming on the show today. Really great conversation. I, I think folks will get a ton out of, of, of kind of listening to this and taking action as a result. For folks who want to kind of follow you and, and kind of find out what you're up to and follow along, what's the best place to connect? The best place is the Elementor blog. So subscribe to just elementor.com and also our YouTube channel, uh, which has over 200,000 subscribers and uh, it's we try to put out the best tutorials and try to uh, update uh, users about the important uh, feature releases so that's uh, another place awesome ben pines thanks so much thank you bye bye